In this video, I want to talk about the relationship between conventional longitudinal confirmatory factor models and so-called latent state trait models. Here you can see a conventional longitudinal confirmatory factor analysis model that in latent state trait theory or from the perspective of that theory, we would also call a latent state model or a multi-state model. What does this model do? It just simply specifies a separate factor at each time point. You use the same set of indicators on multiple time points, in this case two, and so at each time point you have your latent factor that represents the true scores uh, for a set of indicators. And so in this latent state model or multi-state model, the latent state factors can be correlated across time, and that correlation can be used to assess the stability of individual differences across time. Models like this are very commonly used to analyze longitudinal data. And in this presentation here, I want to show you how a model like this can be turned into a latent state trait model and then what that, what that latent state trait model is good for or how that might yield some information that this latent state model does not produce. And so then you should also see the connection between a model like this and a latent state trait model. Now the latent state trait model or latent state trait models in general were developed by Rolf Steyer in the late 80s and early 90s in response to the so-called person situation debate in psychology where people were debating are psychological constructs more trait-like driven by person effects or are psychological constructs state that are driven by situations and situational effects. And then well, part of the debate was how can we measure traits and states. So how would we express that, for example, with latent variables in factor models? How can we get a latent variable that represents a trait effect? How can we get a latent variable that represents a state effect or situation effect? And so then those latent variables would allow us to find out whether psychological constructs are traits or states or a mixture of both. And so Rolf Steyer developed this latent state trait theory that allows us to explicitly define latent trait variables and latent state residual variables and other variables to express person effects and um, situation effects in terms of latent variables and separate them from random measurement error. Now, how can we turn our latent state model or conventional confirmatory factor analysis model into a latent state trait model? So in this case here with two measurement occasions where we have just two states, so to say, tau one and tau two, we actually can derive an equivalent model that will produce the same fit and the same degrees of freedom as the previous model by simply introducing a structural equation that has a second order factor psi, that would be the trait factor. So the trait factor would account for the covariance across time, what was previously estimated as that covariance between tau one and tau two now goes into the variance of the trait. So the variance of the trait will be equal to the covariance of those state factors in this model. And then in addition, in the structural equation, we also have so-called state residuals zeta. Those state residual factors characterize residual variance in the latent state factors tau one and tau two after accounting for the trait. So the trait captures the person-specific variance, the variance component that is stable across time, whereas zeta one and zeta two are the residuals that capture situation effects and person by situation interactions at a given time point. Now you can see that this model is a second order factor model or we say sometimes a hierarchical factor model. There are also many other ways in which a latent state trait model can be parameterized. Um, and I have other videos that show that as well. For example, how a latent state trait model can be obtained as a bifactor model. And there are also other versions of latent state trait models. Some use only a single indicator um, at each time point as presented, for example, by David Kenny and um, Zautra in 1995. And so, in this latent state trait model here, we're basically now modeling the across time covariance of the states by introducing this trait factor. What advantage does this have? So why is this better than um, just estimating those covariances? It's not necessarily better, but it is helpful 
in cases where you want to find out is a construct more a trait or is a construct more state-like or if you have measurements if you have a new test or a new questionnaire and you want to find out is this questionnaire measuring something that is more stable over time more trait-like or is this measuring something that is more state-like and more variable for example a mood questionnaire or an emotion questionnaire as opposed to a personality construct that's maybe more stable such as intelligence or extraversion or something like that because this model breaks down the variance of the first order factors of the latent state factors and allows for a variance decomposition based on which we can then determine trait and state residual components. Now, as I said, this particular model with just two time points is equivalent to the model with just correlated states. And that's because in this model here, we have to fix both of these second order factor loadings to one, otherwise the model isn't identified. And so as a result, we're only estimating the um, variance here of the trait and then the variances of the state residuals. Whereas in the first order model, uh, where we have correlated states, we would be estimating just the variances of each state, tau1 and tau2, and then their covariance. We also have three parameters in that model. Now, if you have more than two time points, that situation changes, and then the model is only equivalent under certain conditions, so under certain circumstances, and it's not generally the case that the latent state trait model is identical to the latent state model with covariances among the states, because the covariances in the latent state model are all freely estimated, and so there's no restriction on the covariance structure there, whereas in the latent state trait model, the trait, the second order trait, imposes a unidimensional structure on the first order state factors, and so with more than two time points, then that um, becomes restrictive um, at some point or under, uh, under certain conditions and then the model will have more degrees of freedom than the model that just allows the first order state factors to be correlated. But that just as an aside, now let's take a look into how this latent state trait model provides something that may be useful above and beyond what the latent state model provides. And so in this latent state trait model, we have a decomposition of the first order true score or latent state variance. So the first order factors tau are called latent states in latent state trait theory because they contain both trait and state residual components. And so any given state at any given point in time, latent state trait theory assumes that the true score of a person is a function of that person's trait score and that person's or and the state residual score that characterizes situation effects and person by situation interactions and so as a result the latent state variance can be broken down into variance that is trait variance or variance xi and variance zeta t that is due to situation effects and person by situation interactions Based on this additive variance decomposition, we can then define a so-called consistency coefficient. The consistency coefficient characterizes the proportion of trait variance in the first order state factors. So it looks at the ratio of variance xi divided by variance tau t, and it's equal to what programs like, for example, m plus give as r squared latent variable, because in this model, the first order state factors are explained by the second order trait factor um, xi, or their variance is explained. And so there's an r squared value for the first order state factors, and that r squared uh, value is exactly equal to consistency, because that's what is due to the trait. So this consistency coefficient allows you to look at how trait-like you are attribute is that you're measuring, for example, if you find that the consistency is 0.8 or R squared is 0.8 for the latent state factors, then that means that 80% of the variance in the true scores at a given time point is due to trait effects. And that would point to a very trait-like construct, like for example, you might find something like that for personality constructs like extraversion or something like that. Also, you can derive a coefficient that's called occasion specificity. Occasion specificity is 1 minus r squared. So 
it's the rest, so to say, that is not explained by the trait, the residual variance in the tau factors that is not due to xi. And so that is given as the variance zeta t divided by variance tau t, or in programs like m plus, you would get that as one minus r squared, which m plus, for example, gives as the standardized residual variance for the latent variables. Now, if you find, for example, that occasion specificity is 0.5, then this would mean that 50% of the true score variance at that time point is explained by situation effects and or person by situation interactions. And that points to a relatively state-like construct. So that's something that we would, for example, expect for constructs like subjective well-being, life satisfaction, emotions, where there's a, has a stronger state component, where your mood or something like that depends more on the momentary situation, a little bit more, where this is more influenced by day-to-day -day variations than things like intelligence, for example, that tend to be very stable. I hope that you found this presentation useful to learn a little bit more about longitudinal confirmatory factor analysis and latent state trait models. Check out the description for more videos. If you like these types of videos, then please subscribe to my channel and leave a comment in the comment section in case you have other topics that you would like to see discussed. And I'll see you next time.